Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Written Page Podcast, a podcast about books that you can uh, listen to and uh, watch if uh, the technology does work, which we hope it will, on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, coming to you from the town of Jackson in the state of Tennessee. And today uh, we have, for the second time, an author that I really enjoy, and the reason why she's back on the show is that she's written a new novel. A few years ago, we had her on the show discussing this book, The Lost Boy's Gift, and just um, a few weeks ago, really, uh, this book hit the market, The Hurricane Girls, and it's an excellent novel that I have uh, read to my uh, daughter out loud and that I have really enjoyed, that I've also written a little uh, column about for the Spanish language uh, journal, uh, online journal, La Pagina Escrita, and the author of this book is right now in Texas and joining us from her home there. It's Kimberly Willis Holt. Kimberly, thank you very much for answering our call a second time and welcome to The Written Page. Thank you, Anton. I appreciate being asked back. It was fun the first time, so I'm looking forward to it today. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. feel great. I like, I'm a morning person, so this is my time. <laughs> Same here. It does, <laughs> it does work for me. Now, um, the Hurricane Girls is, is a book that um, has uh, just been published by Christy Ottaviano book, Little Brown and Company uh, out of New York and uh, Boston. And it's a book about three girls, uh, Greer, Joya Mia, uh, and Kiki. And to, to start off, I'm wondering how and when did the project of writing this book uh, begin? How did you come up with this trio of friends? Well, um, I actually came up with the character of Greer years ago. Um, it was going to be a young adult book. I had this idea. I always wanted to write about the West Bank of New Orleans. The setting was really important to me because I lived on the West Bank of New Orleans in high school. My dad was in the Navy. Um, we moved a lot, but that was the last assignment he had. And so I love the West Bank of New Orleans. It gets ignored a lot in literature it also isn't always by uh, New Orleans locals con considered part of New Orleans, and it really is. It's part of greater New Orleans. And I, I felt like the setting was probably what drove me to the story. But the story of Greer was going to be a fairly dark young adult book years ago when I uh, thought about it. And my editor um, had said, you know, why don't you think about, you know, doing it in a middle grade? situation. And I had already thought of the three friends um, idea. And I liked the idea of switching their points of view. So really, it it started years ago with an, a little germ of an idea. And I'm talking about years ago, maybe 15 years ago, um, that was going to be a dark young adult book about one girl. And then um, and certain elements were there, the movie theater, I worked at a movie theater, you know, as, uh, on the West Bank. And so I wanted to use that, but it became, once I had those three friends, I got really excited about it. And I became, I didn't feel like I was compromising by writing a middle grade. And actually I enjoyed it so much. I'm glad I didn't go with the young adult idea. So besides having one character uh, versus having three, um, how does your, or how did your approach uh, change from writing a young adult novel to writing a middle grade novel? Because I suppose there are some um, adjustments to be made when you do that. Well, again, it was just a germ of an idea with just some sketchy notes. Um, so that was easy to abandon. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea of Greer. Um, I love the idea of having a character who felt guilty about something that had happened to someone that she cared about. And so that part remained. Um, I don't want to give away too much. The outcome of the sister's accident was going to be totally different in the young mm -hmm. adult book. And so I was able to approach it in a different, lighter way. So, so really, it wasn't a huge change because I could abandon those sketchy notes. Once I, I started thinking, oh, why don't I do three friends? Then I thought about a triathlon. 
Um, you know, and that would be a wonderful way to structure the book. That's really what helped me more than anything is the triathlon. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, team triathlons, there's three parts to a triathlon. Now, a lot of people run them by them or do the whole thing by themselves, but there are team triathlons. And I thought, what if I did that? And, and that would give me that backbone for the story. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that changed is, and I love this part is being able to be in different points of view. Um, you know, as long as I could stay true to each character. So they, cause some, sometimes I don't know about you, but I've read books where there are different points of view like that. And they sort of sound the same. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted that if you didn't even see the name of the person in the story or the chapter, like we did it, that you would know who was speaking, who was, whose head you were in. As long as I could do that, then I felt like it empowered me really. And it was fun, you know, cause I got to have these three different storylines, these, and, and also weave them together so that they became one novel, one story. I yeah. think that was very well done, really. The the idea that each one of these characters uh, are not only different characters and different girls, they have different names and they have different uh, backgrounds and family histories and all of that, but um, also the fact that they uh, seem to have different voices. And I think that was, you know, really well accomplished in this in this in this book. And I wonder if that is really the reason why you decided to uh, concentrate on a specific character on each one of the chapters. Uh, is, did you do that consciously? Uh, was there a reason behind having each one of the uh, chapters um, told from the point of view of one girl? Um, well, it was, a, I believe it might've been a suggestion. This is what's terrible. So much time has passed since Christy and I discussed this story, but she said, I, I think I always was gonna alternate, but she felt like I needed a lead char a character which to me is Greer, because that's what drove the triathlon. That's what drove, and she had the most serious, um, you know, story line. And so I'm forgetting your question now. Is that what were, what were you No, wanting? just just the fact that, you know, uh, the book is uh, structured in short chapters, which I think okay. is is common in, in other novels that you've right. written before, but each one of them is told from the point of view of one of the girls. So you concentrate right. on one of the girls uh, in each one of the of the chapters. Um, why did you decide to do it that way? Well, because that way it became all of their story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was interesting because I think people favor different characters too, or relate to different characters. So they got to get inside the skin of each of these characters but maybe one of them they can identify with more than others. It was trickier than I thought it would be because mm -hmm. we're working with a timeline. And so, you know, I, it was like, sort of like playing catch. Okay, here, you're taking this up, you know, and always you couldn't go back. You kind of had to, and you had to be in that person's point of view. So they may not have the advantage of like, if you're in Greer's point of view, you might not have advantage of, what Greer, uh, Kiki just did or Hoyamiya just did. So that was kind of tricky. And I had to make sure that I was keeping all of that, um, not just cohesive, but the mm -hmm. fact that um, I wasn't giving them some knowledge that they didn't, the other character had. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and you know, since you're talking a little bit about the uh, writing process, uh, I'm also wondering, you know, what that was like. What was the writing uh, process like? Did you have a clearly defined idea of where you uh, wanted to take the story or did it evolve as you kept writing or was it a mixture of both situations? I guess it was a mixture. What I did, I used index cards. Um, and so I had different colors for the different girls. And, you know, blue, I think yellow, pink. Mm -hmm. And so I always kind of knew and I could, you know, put them in a certain order. And then I also use, I think I've discussed that probably at length, probably on the last time Aristotle's inclined that I talk mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. the way I do my <laughs> plotting, you know, with the act one, act two, act three, but there's these turning points in them that are pivotal. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I would go from those, you know, I use both that graph and the index card. So there was a lot of, this type of writing for me um, probably does take more uh, pre-writing or pre-planning than say another book that might be one character where I just organically 
sort of write it and go, oh, or am I fitting this on the Aristotle's incline? I still use that Aristotle's incline. I'm very attached to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's my favorite way of plotting. But but at the same time, the index cards, that was very helpful in this situation mm -hmm. too. To kind of keep uh, the, the the story in check and ordered and so so you knew exactly what each girl was going to be doing or 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 how it was going to evolve. Yes, and they each had their own plot line. So each there were three Aristotle inclines because mm -hmm. they each had that opening scene for their story. They each had a midpoint. They had a plot point one, which is in between the uh, starting point and the midpoint. So these are turning points that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, anybody that wants to know this in any depth, you know, uh, uh, there's a book called The Weekend Novelist. And he has later editions that he co-wrote with someone, but my favorite editions or printings or editions are the early ones. I have, I own the third printing. I've worn the book out and replaced it with another one. Of course, I had to go through the used market, but it really explains it beautifully. They use um, two storylines. They use the story of Cinderella that a lot of us are very familiar with, but also a book uh, by Ann Tyler, who's one of my favorite writers um, and it, she writes adult literature, but she, uh, the accidental tourist. Mm -hmm. And he uses that, but that book a lot. He's showing unfolding that story, how to unfold a plot, a book and storyline. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the girls though, they each had their own um, line. And so I would have that on the index cards too. I would put on each card, like if this was plot point one, you know, is this part of plot point one? Or is this midpoint? And that changes a lot. And that's just because of rewriting, you know, so, um, you know, but they're fun. They can, you know, you can handle them. I get those large index cards and, and it, that's how, that's how I worked it. So sort of how I planned the, the novel, but it really was a fun way to write a book because you're always in somebody diff different point, somebody different point of view the point of view of somebody different mm -hmm. and so it it changed it up a lot and made it interesting for me as a writer yeah I didn't have that um there's always a point in most of my books <laughs> where I get sick of the book and I didn't feel that with this book mm -hmm. you know and I because I always felt like I, I felt like I was writing three books in a way mm -hmm. So, so what was different in, 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 in this case? Was it because you had three stories or, or was it because you just liked the plot better? Because, you know, I understand the feeling of uh, working on something for so long. I myself am working on something right now that I just want to finish. And at some point you get really, you know, tired of having to work on it so much and doing so many hours. Uh, was it just the variety of the stories in this case? Or? It was the variety. It wasn't because every book that I write, I have to love the storyline in the beginning. In the beginning, I'm still so empowered when I get an idea. I imagine it's that way with everybody and it's so exciting. And then you get to this point and it's not always the middle. Sometimes it's really early on. <laughs> You're like, whoa, oh no, I don't know what happens next. Or was this wasn't a really good idea? You know, I never felt that way. And I think it was the variety and, and maybe thinking it out a little bit. I knew that um, each of them had these different um, storylines and that that made it interesting. I just, and I kind of knew where they were all going to go um, with that. The one that was challenging for me um, on the storyline was Hoya Mia mm -hmm. um, because hers didn't feel as heavy, you know, as neither uh, uh, the other girls, none of them was, of course, heavy as Greer's, neither Kiki or Hoya Mia, but, you know, Kiki's is hard too. You know, her father has left. Mm -hmm. They don't know where he is. Um, he's left them in this huge debt and um, so that was very hard for her. And so that makes that, but I wanted to make sure Hoya Mia's problem felt substantial. Mm -hmm. And then I finally realized it does, it mm -hmm. does to her. 
Desert. Well, I, well, I think through Hoya Mia, you're also exploring uh, the experience of immigration in the United States, not necessarily through her, but through her family, because she was born yeah. in the U.S., but she is the product of a, of, of, of a history of uh, immigration. So I, I found it very interesting that, you know, the, the, the difficulties that she had to deal with had to do um, with being born in a country that she felt a part of, but her family did not really come from this country. Well, her parents did, but the yeah, but exactly. grandparents, yeah, the just the, uh, the 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 family yes. history before and that, that was yeah. a challenge. And I have um, a sensitivity reader um, afterwards. Uh, actually, a friend of my daughter's who is a well loved librarian. Yeah, uh, she was at the time with Arlington Public Library, and I think she was she was voted one of the most, but through ALA, one of the most loved librarians. You know, so she was perfect to uh, read it. And was didn't hold back. And oh goodness, I am so thankful to her because she was days away from walking down the aisle <laughs> to get married <laughs> and did this for me. Um, and so she um she was very honest. And you know, she said, you know, sometimes this feels like the parents are the the first time or are or have immigrated here and not just the grand no, you know. So I had to kind I listened to what she said and and it was so helpful. Um, I hope she's happy with the decisions I made, but she, you know, was, it was very helpful. She said it did. In fact, I saw her the other day, at, I did a signing and she said, you know, sometimes she said it felt like her and that made me feel good that Hoya Me was like her, you know, so. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned before also that, you know, some of the story uh, does come from the fact that you lived in the New Orleans area, you, you, you worked in a, in a movie theater, um, and and that kind of leads me to wonder uh, in what in what ways um, do the experiences of Greer and and Hoya Mia and Kiki um, mirror your own experiences at their age? I think in some cases it won't be the case, you know, because um, you know Hoya Mia has a story that is probably not like your own necessarily. But but in what ways are the girls like you or what you knew at their age? Um my setting was a little different than theirs at that age. Cause you know, I moved to new Orleans in the, at high school years, but in junior high I was in Washington state. And so some of the, the, the main experience, and I pulled from this, even from my high school years mm -hmm. was the feeling of friendship. Um, how important friends are. Um, you know, I went to an all girl public school in new Orleans and I'm so thankful for that experience. Um, because it eliminated things that I guess people that go to a co-ed school um, probably deal with, you know, in maybe competitiveness or, you know, whatever. So we, and we also, most of us, you know, because a lot of people went to private schools in New Orleans too. Most of us came from working class people. So there wasn't like the rich girl, you know, <laughs> and I think we were all like kind of in that line of, you know, we're working, our parents were working class people. And so that was a wonderful experience. And I feel like that's what the girls come from too. I think that's pretty um, evident. Greer having a little more advantage than the other two, but not really because they're struggling because of the father's, you know, movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, the babysitting thing, uh, <laughs> although I loved babysitting, you know, that was, you know, Kiki and the whole, she's going to babysit and really doesn't really doesn't want to babysit, but she's like, oh, I've got this idea. You know, I can relate to Kiki, probably of the three, I can relate to that part of her so much because I was a big dreamer, a big planner. And, you know, I can, you know, remember planning things out that I lost interest in and just dropped the ball. Um, I was a big sister of two girls, uh, two sisters, and I wish that I could was as great of a big sister as Hoya Mia. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was probably a little more like Greer in that respect, you know, not, I remember my parents making me babysit the day I was night that I was supposed to go to a concert with some friends and being very resentful of that. And, um, you know, I look back on that and with shame, but so maybe that some of that comes, you know, from that, uh, you know, I've told my sister, even though this tragic accident didn't happen, my baby sister who I was 11 years older than. I do remember in Washington state one time 
we were, we went with our church group to Mount Rainier and, uh, my parents, you know, I got to play, 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 you know, I was in junior high and my other sister, we were all having fun in the snow. And my parents said, could you just watch Angela, you know, inside this lodge area while we go out for a little bit, you know, outside. And they did. And then for some reason, I can't remember what brought me outside. And I had my sister on her, on my hip, but I walk outside. It is freezing out there. She <laughs> doesn't have a coat on. And like every adult that saw me was like, Get my child. you know, <laughs> and I felt like I was so shy and awkward anyway. And I felt like an idiot. And of course she got sick. The whole, you know, was coughing and sneezing all the way, um, you know, back to the place. But I know that sounds so uh, minor compared to what Greer's sister Darby went through, mm -hmm. but that's where it started. You know, it started there because I can relate to that huge feeling of guilt and, and my mother making me feel even guiltier, you know, on the way back um, because I had made that foolish decision for some reason to step outside with my baby sister with no coat on. I don't even know if I had a coat on. If I did, shame on me, but <laughs> I'm sure if I'd remembered to put a coat on for myself, I would have put it on for her. But so even though those are so separated, it's a good example of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, fiction does start with truth, but it moves away from it so much so that it becomes its own truth. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things I can I think that's very, I find that very interesting because uh, I always um, find interesting when people mm, or when I hear people say something like, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, stranger than fiction or, you know, uh, r reality uh, surpasses fiction in many ways. And I, I, I do agree with that, but it couldn't be any other way because fiction does stem from reality and it starts from reality and then it goes maybe in a different direction, but you cannot write um, truthfully or completely truthfully about something unless that something has to do in some way with reality. I agree. And, and that, the, that can be a problem when you're uh, with family members sometimes um, <laughs> because they will now, I don't think they would ever go, Oh, I remember when that happened with Angela and that's why you wrote that about Darby, but they will find the tiniest little things that they will think are autobiographical. And those things usually aren't mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> They're dealing with their own <laughs> memory and guilt, I guess, or whatever. And it's so it's always so funny to me, the connections that they think, oh, that was that, you know, in fact, the other night, my dad was at my house and he said something, I was talking about a friend from childhood that he couldn't remember in my high school years. And he goes, and I had just told him how this was not autobiographical. I said, dad, I used our house. Greer's house is my house from high school. Her neighborhood's my neighborhood. And I said, but the story's not, of course. But as yeah, I said, all storylines are different. He was, even after, and I'm telling you, this was five minutes later. He's like, <laughs> well, is she in the book? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. No, she's not in the book, you know? But but the relationship I had with my friends, I, I have to say the feelings I had about them. And, you know, I don't know if you even appreciate it so much as I do now. You know, I look back now. Mm -hmm. And, and realize what wonderful friends, you know, I had and a rich experience, you know, going through the pep rallies, uh, the sneaking in the places we shouldn't have been sneaking into <laughs> in the French Quarter, you know, um, just those sort of things. They make for my, my a rich um, memory landscape. And, and that, and that's where I guess I could have gone into young adult with, you know, with some mm -hmm. of those, those memories, but I, you know, that's a, the lovely thing about fiction is that we get to, we do get to pull back from our lives and we do get to re go back and visit. You know, I've been told by a lot of people, including my daughter, you know, who's a lot younger than me. And she says, you remember things I don't remember about your childhood. And I think, you know, maybe that's why, maybe all writers mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you know, since this uh, novel is set in New Orleans, and I've been to New Orleans at least three times uh, for different reasons, mostly conferences that I participated in that were held there, and it's not really that far from Jackson, Tennessee, in the whole scheme of things. Uh, you know, your description of New Orleans was in so many ways uh, very vivid. I did recognize some of the places. Uh, you know, that I had been to, especially, you know, when you're talking about the French Quarter, when you're talking about the river, the ferry, etc. So that was something I also really enjoyed. Even my daughter at some point kind of remembered, you know, Café du Monde or, or, or the courtyard of the two sisters, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that just brought the book closer to my own experience of New Orleans. I'm glad. And, um, you know, my dad took that ferry to work every day. His office, um, Naval Headquarters, wherever, was uh, down from the French market, you know, so, you know, coffee de Mon is here, then you've got the French market and it was a little bit farther down. So the ferry was a part of my life. And, and also, you know, I did use the ferry sometimes with friends to go across the river and, and we've done it, my family and I've done it and walked around Algiers point, which I love. I love that area. Um, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. The book is Hurricane Girls and uh, its author, Kimberly Willis Holt, joining us from Texas uh, this morning on the written page. And, you know, you were talking about uh, friendship, and I think that definitely is an aspect, an element of the book that's uh, very important. Um, and, you know, often we, we, we think of uh, American society as uh, fairly individualistic, uh, but I wonder if overcoming adversity is something that you really have to do with others. I agree. And as a writer, it's kind of what makes our stories, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, sometimes my husband and I will be watching a movie and you go, well, why did they do that? Now that's just gonna happen. I said, we wouldn't have a story. <laughs> <laughs> if that had not happened, if they had done the right thing, that would not have happened. And so, yes, um, I think, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, the reasons we write, um, you know, communicating, getting along with others, uh, whether it be a, a racial situation or financial situation or just a situation where, you know, I was always the new girl and had to navigate my way through that. Um, you know, yeah, I think that that's the kind of stuff that we are doing, you know, day to day as people. And it's also what as writers, we explore mm -hmm. on the page. And, yeah. and, and what does that mean uh, to you in, in, in a time of, of uh, climate change, you know, when the altering events like hurricanes, like Hurricane Katrina, for example, but, but these events, uh, hurricane storms, uh, uh, you know, th th that kind of uh, difficult situation to deal with, that, that becomes a regular occurrence with climate change. Uh, uh, how important in those cases uh, do you think the idea of friendship, the idea of community can be? It's everything. Um, I think New Orleans is, is a fine example of that because people went away. I don't know if you were at the ALA that was right after, you You go to ALA, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. That's right. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the I, I was I, I was not at the one that was right after, but but I yeah. was and it was eerie. Um it not around where the we were having the, the conference, but when we went to dinner, you know, I remember we, we walked there, you know, into the French Quarter, and that was very eerie because it was empty. Um it didn't feel the same. And I went back with my mother not long after that too, and visited a friend who lives in the French Quarter. Same thing. You know, it's still, it was probably that year, still hadn't really come back. Um, but this is the thing, people wanted to go back. I would visit schools, uh, especially in Texas, but of course people were scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas, a lot of people went to Texas. And I can remember whenever I would talk about, you know, New Orleans, um, I would have children come up to me and say, that, that's my home. And sometimes they would say with such pride, I'm going back. We're going back this summer after school. We're going to go back. And, you know, the same with my friends. That meant so much to them to go back home. Um, you know, it's like the part, um, and I'll jump to this, and I hope whoever reads that and read it will read, you know, where the, you know, the, 
they're talking about the, you know, the lights. I remember my friend, Veronica, uh, Ronnie and Eric Webb, you know, they were so helpful. She's a high school friend. Um, and, you know, she said she'll just always remember being on the West Bank Expressway where it had been built up high and looking around and seeing all the lights going off, all the, you know, fireworks. And they were all coming from backyards. And she said, because we were all so glad to be home. And so it wasn't just the land of New Orleans. Um, it's the people. You know, mm. we go back as a people, people sometimes live places that they would not have picked, you know, and I'm not talking about New Orleans necessarily, but, you know, we've all been through those towns and you go, how do they live here? They live there because of the people, maybe their family's there, their friends are there. That's the, you know, and I think community is so important and we can build those communities everywhere. You know, my neighborhood feels like a community, but not all neighborhoods feel like communities. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody's church is their community. Um, maybe somebody's workplace is their community, their school. Um, but I think that community is so important. And so I hope that when I wrote this book, you felt that at least mm -hmm. with these three girls, mm -hmm. they have, and that's a very small community, but you know, even the people they interact with, I think you can see the pride that that area um, or those people have for their area, the love that they have for New Orleans and each other, like Hoya Mia, <laughs> when she goes to the, you know, to do her part of the triathlon and she turns around and her whole family's there, you know, her <laughs> extended family. I mean, she's brought, and she's horrified about it, you know, at first, you know, and then as she starts that cycling part, she realizes she was so loved and, and she's got this community of her family, you know, behind her. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Kimberly, through Hoya Mia and her family, you also, I think, underscore in this book um, the importance of the Latino community in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Could you uh, yes. talk a little bit about that? That was such an important part that I wanted to explore because I remember um, being in Amarillo, I don't live in Amarillo anymore, but listening to a, a program on NPR and it, and it was about the coming back of New Orleans and the restaurants were such an important part of that to get the tourists back. And the people that they had had originally working in the restaurants weren't there for the most mm -hmm. part. And they pulled on the Latino community. They came and they worked there and they rebuilt. And they were in the construction workers that rebuilt homes. They were a major part of the restaurant industry and getting it back on its feet. And then I read, um, as I researched, I read about, and I'm sorry, it's in my acknowledgments, the, the gentleman, and he's since passed, which, you know, I, which is sad. He died young, um, who, who had a restaurant in Houston. But he knew those construction workers. He was an entrepreneur. <laughs> he knew they would like their, you know, homeland food. And so he moved to New Orleans and did food trucks and went around to the construction sites and sold food to them. That was the food that they loved eating. And I, that whole, that gave me it's such a, a lot of her background story, her story mm -hmm. of her parents. Why did her parents come there? Um, you know, why did, you know, their dream of having a, a, the, the, a, well, a restaurant originally, but they, like the mother says, we do have a restaurant. It's on wheels. You mm. know, we, we, our dream changed a little bit, but this is our dream and we're going to buy another truck. Um, you know, so I, that excited me to read his story. It fit into what I was trying to do to show that the Latino community had rebuilt. It is why I chose Hoya Mia, to be honest with you. I chose her because I wanted to tell that side of New Orleans rebuilding. Yeah. And in, in reality, what you mentioned is very important, I think. And what, what makes, um, to me, Hoya Mia such an interesting character and her family background such an important part of the book is the fact that her family also shows uh, the necessity of not necessarily abandoning your dreams, but maybe changing them, modifying them in order to 
adjust them to the reality around you. You can still have the dream, but it may be a different version of it. That's right. It could be option B. <laughs> you know, <laughs> option B is not always a bad option. And, you know, I've had to learn that. And, you know, we can, I'm a planner like Kiki, you know, I'm a dreamer like Kiki. Um, and, you know, but I've had to readjust what I consider what was in the original plan, you mm -hmm. know, times one, one, and, and an example, and I love living where I live and I've, I've definitely found the, um, attributes of it, but we had, before we moved here, we had bought a lot in the Texas panhandle that we were going to build on. Well, after we were, but my husband was going to work here the last part of his career. And we had lived here before and we'd always said, we're never moving back there <laughs> to the Metroplex <laughs> uh, traffic. And it's even worse now, but there's many attributes about it. But the main reason we're here is our daughter, grown daughter on her first trip here said, I'm going to try to live here. I want to live. Here. <laughs> so, forget the lot, you know? So we're always readjusting, um, you know, we're always readjusting on what, what makes us feel like we have a happy, successful life, you know, and yes, so there's that. Yeah. And hurricanes make you do that too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, it, look, hurricanes are going to happen in New Orleans. They just are. Uh, God forbid another one like Katrina comes around or, you know, but it's just, but it will, you know, and, and, and hopefully maybe it won't be as, they'll be more equipped for it, you know, in New Orleans. But when you know that's part of what's there and you keep going back, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's a reason there's a, and it's because of community and loved ones and wanting to be back there. Yeah. For uh, the Hurricane Girls, uh, Kimberly, how, how much research did you have to do and what was the most challenging aspect of that research? The most challenging for me was that um, we were during a pandemic. And so getting, you know, going out, I could have driven down there and stayed in my car. I was one of these people that really took the pandemic seriously. Um, Same and, here. Yeah. <laughs> And we just didn't get out. So I was like, how am I going? I like to know this, even though, gosh, I grew up half of my child or part of my childhood was there. And even my college years were there, part of my college years. But I really, it, I felt like I was at a disadvantage because I was writing, you know, more currently. And there's this thing called Google Earth <laughs> that helped me understand the setting better. And there's something called friends that I called and talked to extensively about New Orleans. And, you know, like I, I assumed Popeye's was the big chicken place still, you know, it was when I was um, there. Nope. Brothers. Brothers is now. And brothers, they said, is kind of taking the place of what we thought of as Popeye's. Yeah, they still have Popeye's, but my friend said the enthusiasm was for that. And those are little tiny details. Mm -hmm. They help. It helped me, you know, say, look, what kind of, you know, if I would, if, they were going to do a restaurant to celebrate, you know, what restaurant would that be? Um, that was part of the research. Another part um, was talking to a triathlon coach. And I think he was in the Northeast actually. And he goes, how'd you get my name? And I said, I Googled you and you were the first youth triathlon <laughs> coach that came up and he, thank goodness. Cause he was wonderful, you know, so helpful in, in helping me understand because I've never done a triathlon. And so he was able to, um, you know, help me understand the mindset and also what do you do, you know, during that time I interviewed one of my daughter's friends who had been a young triathlon, um, a triathlete, I guess. And she had, um, told me her experiences. That's where the, you know, the rain coming down and the kids kicking off their shoes came from. Uh, I interviewed a psychologist uh, for young people who um, I asked her some questions. I'd already was deep in the book at that point, deep in drafts, uh, you know, later draft by the time I talked to her, but I knew she was going to be an important part and told her what I'd done. And, and she was like, yes, that's good. That's good. And then she gave me some great input that, you know, um, some insight and input. And also, you know, at one point, I think I had um, the psychologist when Greer is crying, come over and sit by her 
you know, almost. And I think she said, I would probably never do that. She said, I would be compassionate. And she told me, and so see those again, little things like that, that if, um, that, you know, that are so important. So yes, that books are not done by one person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they really aren't. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm doing most of the work, but I don't, I don't know what I would have done without all those, that support and all that help. And also Google earth, because I was able to go to my house and I, I said, oh my goodness, if the FBI was looking at wondering what the heck is going to happen <laughs> on Lapalka Boulevard, because that somebody keeps going to Lapalka Boulevard and going down the street there. Um, you know, and I would go through the neighborhood and, you know, that was fun. And, and so many memories came back because of that. But at the same mm -hmm. time, things had changed. Lapaco Boulevard looked very different. You know, the businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually do that myself with my hometown in, in the Northwest of Spain, where, you know, I go on Google Earth and sometimes I actually do a virtual tour of, you know, the, the, the part of town where I grew up in and, and where my grandparents lived and where my parents live and, and everything. So, I mean, Google Earth is really a good, uh, a good device, very good resource. Um, you know, the story is set in 2018. Um, uh, but I wonder is if because you wrote this book during the global pandemic. Uh, do you think that is apparent in any way in the book, the fact that it was written during that time or or not really? Well, I started it during that time. Oh. I didn't finish it during that time. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be a yes or no. Maybe you're not yeah, sure I'm about it. But I, I, but I wonder, because you did mention that you had started it during the, the pandemic and there were certain, you know, difficulties that you had to overcome in the whole writing process because of that. Well, just the fact that I couldn't go back to, I would have mm -hmm. gone back to New Orleans, of course, and driven the streets. That would have been a day for me, mm -hmm. um, just driving the streets and, you know, writing down observations. So that I, I still wish I could have done that mm -hmm. just because that's the way I like to write. Um, you know, when I was writing, when Zachary Beaver came to town, that was set, modeled after Claude, Texas, 30 minutes from um, Amarillo. I can't tell you how many times I went to Claude, Texas and drove around and drove those streets and found Toby's house and Cal's house and Ms. Murdy May's house, all those, all those places and knew where the school was. And it makes a difference in the mm -hmm. writing. The advantage I did have was that I had lived on the West Bank. And I would imagine the same with you, you know, if you're writing about Spain, mm -hmm place you're writing about, even though you're depending on Google Earth to help you fill in the details. That's what we're doing. I have a problem when somebody picks a setting <laughs> that exists. I'm not talking about science fiction or fantasy world that they've never, ever been to, you know, and it, I think, I, I think the, it doesn't feel authentic, you know, something about it's not going to feel authentic. Yeah. You know? Do, you, do right. you think, Kimberly, that wh wherever you said your novel or your writing, um, in, in some ways, you're really uh, always writing about the place where you grew up in, whether it's that place or not. Yes. <laughs> because, you know, uh, you, you, you can be setting the, the novel somewhere else, but then, you know, the-, the It's the, always gonna have my world come into it. That's right, sure. the, stuff, the, the stuff that you lived through and, and, and that kind of shaped yeah. you as a person always becomes yeah. important, I feel like. Yeah, I think it's what makes uh, somebody who writes for young people different than an adult writer. And, um, you know, I, write, I read adult writers that don't always have a grasp on childhood. They've mm -hmm. forgotten it somewhere. They'll say something that a four-year-old will observe and I'll think, really? Or, uh, you know, a 12 year old even, or 10 year old. And I'll think maybe 12 year old because 12, some 12 year olds do think like adults, but mm -hmm. maybe like an eight year old or something. And I'll think, I don't think eight year olds think like that. I think that we, as people that write for young people, we know that I'm sorry, Georgie, sorry. <laughs> this oh, I, is do have, I do have a dog too. She, she's right here. She's quiet for now. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> okay. but we have people in our backyard. That's why she's doing that. But um, yes, getting back to the the real world, um, our worlds. I think we, as people that write for young people, we have that connection still with our childhood mm -hmm. that not every writer has. And that's why they don't 
necessarily write for young people are to me aren't as successful at writing for young people. We probably all know adult writers who have attempted writing for young people and they may sell a lot of books because people know their name from their adult books. But when we read, and not, this isn't everyone, some are able to do it, but some cannot understand, you know, they've lost something along the way mm -hmm. you know, with that connection with, with young people. Yeah. Going back to the idea of friendship between these uh, three girls, Hoya Mia and Greer and uh, Kiki, I, I love the, the drawings as well. I, I love the, um, the postcard of New Orleans that appears right yes, there. Yes, that's Kobe Fagan's work. Yes, she did a beautiful job. Yeah. It, she, she really did. Um, yes. And, you know, and there's the, um, the steamboat uh, on the Mississippi River. And um, going back to the idea of, of, of friendship between these, these three girls, uh, the Hurricane Girls, um, Kimberly, in, in what ways do you think uh, friendship has changed for kids and especially for girls today? Uh, you know, due to, you know, the the the, uh, the different time period in which, you know, girls and, and kids now grow up in, they, you know, uh, compared with when you grew up or when I grew up, in what ways do you think friendship has changed for kids and girls particularly today? And in what ways is it the same as in the past? Because I think that that friendship is, a, as we've mentioned, a very important uh, element of this book. Yes, I think that Social media has changed things dramatically. I have a young niece. Um, she's 20 now, but I know that when she's the youngest of the grandchildren of my parents' grandchildren. And, you know, I remember my sister saying, you know, it's really hard to be a young person today. I mean, if they don't get enough followers, you know, that that's devastating to them. It's like saying, this is how many friends I have. And this is how many friends you have. I can't even imagine that because I was a very shy person um, and I didn't have a lot of friends. The friends that I had were very meaningful to me, mm -hmm. but, you know, in quality people, but I can't imagine being a young person today where, you know, it's, it's like a, a billboard, you know, on, on that. So that's gotta be devastating um, to always be, have that part of your life um, you know, present and, and always having to deal with that. And even if somebody doesn't say anything, it's in your head. I know it would have been in my head. It would have been, um, how are they alike? We need people, you know, we do, we need to spend time with people. I, I do think the way we communicate is very different now, um, positive and negative, uh, you know, now, you know, you didn't get on the phone at, well, maybe some people did, but, you know, I, at a certain point we had curfews <laughs> or bedtimes even, I guess I stopped having a bedtime in high school, but I don't remember being on the phone late at night with anyone, you know, it was the house phone. Um, but now everybody has their own. It seems like a lot of people have their own phone as a young person and you can communicate and text and, you know, stay connected. And, and in some ways that's an advantage. In some ways it's a disadvantage because I think being belly to belly, so to speak, mm -hmm. where you're facing someone and talking. I think those skills have started, started to diminish. And, you know, I hate to see that, but friendship itself, it will always be a big part of our lives. And, and it should be, you know, it's, a, it's that community we were talking about a minute ago that we, we build. So I think that, you know, that's always, kids are always going to need other kids to feel like they have friends they're friends with and doing things with them that's going to be important not just talking social media wise but actually doing things um and and that shapes who we are as people but the difference is that social media can also be a destroyer mm -hmm. and especially you know when we bear in mind that you know followers and contacts is, is not the same as friends it isn't but don't I think that would be hard to tell someone who's mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what about books, um, uh, Kimberly? Uh, what role do you think books and literature play uh, in learning to communicate uh, in in this twenty first century? And I say this because some of the characters in this book and the Hurricane Girls have problems communicating. 
uh, you know, with their parents, uh, with other people. Um, and I wonder, what do books and literature offer uh, to people de dealing with trauma that other forms of communication don't necessarily offer? I think they they make us realize we're not alone. Hmm. That in what is wonderful about what has happened, maybe in the last five to 10 years in children's literature is that you're starting to see everyone represented. Mm. Now, in some cases, as we both know, that's being fought um, and that's sad mm -hmm. because everyone needs to be able to relate to somebody, whether it's found in a book. And many times that's where it's found. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll give you a, an old timey <laughs> example, old timey, because it was when I was 12 and I was very shy and I had maybe two friends um, in junior high and still I am friends with those people. Um, I remember reading The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson mm -hmm. McCombs. Mm -hmm. And there was a character in there called Mick. And she was the 12 year old girl. She was either 12 or 13 who wanted to be popular you know that was really important to her now that that book is about a lot of lonely people <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but i could relate to that character so much um to me that's what who the book was about yeah there were other characters in that you know other people say oh no it wasn't about her it that was she was just one of the people but to me as a 12 year old that book was about mick because i could relate to it and it did in some odd way make me feel not so alone and when we, even when we read about other people that we don't necessarily feel like we mirror in any way, mm -hmm. if we read their experiences in their life stories or their stories, maybe we start to have empathy for them. Maybe we start to go, gosh, I feel that way about this too. Mm. You know, and I'm not like that person, but I feel like that person. You know, I feel, you know, again, Hoya Mia um, that I struggled with because she's had such a wonderful, happy family life. And, you know, how do I make her problem seem as important? Well, it is. It's because it shows us, it gives us a look into who she is as a person. She cares about mm -hmm. her family. Mm -hmm. She feel she's, she's not um, aware that her family's doing okay. Mm -hmm. So she's worried, how do I make my family do okay? You know, how do I get my brother a bicycle? How do, you know, um, I take, she takes her sister to the mall, you know, whereas Greer would never have thought, of, even if <laughs> could have, would never have thought of, about taking her sister to the mall. You know, those things are important, but we start reading about other people's experiences and put ourselves in their skin. And I think it makes us better people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not only do we, can we have stories make us feel um, like, oh, there's somebody I can relate to because they're just like me, mm -hmm. but there's also those characters that they're not just like me, but I can relate to what's going on with them or no, I'm looking or, or even more importantly, I'm seeing something differently. Mm -hmm. It's changed me. Yeah, yeah, but based on what you say, Kimberly, it, it, it kind of brings to mind the idea that I think maybe one of the most important aspects of literature, especially when we're reading at an early age in our in our lives, um, is the fact that literature does allow for this space for reflection and for, you know, self-knowledge in a way that maybe other kinds of communication really don't. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And I think that... Um... That's why it's so important, you know, and it's so important that we allow all books, you know, to be available. Um, we should not be telling somebody else what their child should be reading. Um, and, you know, if you want to police what your own child reads, then go for it. You know, I think it's a mistake because if they're for whatever reason, they need to read something Maybe they do need to read it. Maybe they, you know, want to read it. And within reason, I mean, there's, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody will take some outlandish <laughs> example and say, well, what about, you know? Yeah, you, you you can take the exception as the example, though. That's, I think that's part of the problem of of, of some of those 
uh, ideas. But but I wonder, since you mentioned that, um, Kimberly, why do you think this has been such a trend in our country, particularly here in the U.S. as of late, that there's this push towards, you know, banning books and towards, you know, telling other people what they should read and what their kids should read? Or why do you think that is particularly here and not in other parts of the world? Oh. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other parts of the world, but no, I do feel like it has been. It does uh, ha actually, a, a, I can think of an example. I won't bring it up, but I can definitely think of an example where it does happen in other parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I'm saying I'm just we saying just that talk generally since we are here in the U.S. I'm wondering why yeah. it happens. OK, well, I think it's fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think we get afraid of what we're not comfortable with afraid that our world is going to, our world, mm -hmm. our little world, mm -hmm. not the world, but our little world's going to change in a way that makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't look like the world we are used to seeing. And, and so I think that's probably, I think it's fear. Mm -hmm. The book is The uh, Hurricane Girls, and uh, its author is Kimberly Willis Holt this morning on the uh, written page. And as we're winding down the conversation, Kimberly, I have a couple uh, final questions for you, and then I'll let you go, because I know you have other things to do on this beautiful day of September. You're in Texas, and uh, of course, I am in Jackson, Tennessee, as usual. Uh, and uh, we're talking about The Hurricane Girls, a book that just came out just a few weeks ago on Christy Otav Ottaviano books and the author is Kimberly Willis Holt. Now, literature, Kimberly, doesn't necessarily have to be didactic, but what do you hope that uh, young readers and adults alike uh, take away from reading The Hurricane Girls? The importance of friendship. Mm -hmm. um, that you can rely on yourself. Each of the girls has to rely on themselves to some degree. And, and there, we all have an inner strength we can pull on, um, to get us through each day or, you know, more importantly, something that's happened to us, but that we need each other. Um, and it's okay to lean on each other to help us get through those tough moments too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that you can see clearly. And even if you look at the cover, you know, with the girls wearing the same. I love that. Um, I love, yeah, I love the embrace. Yeah. Uh, the embrace, uh, you know, the the blurred background there. It's a, it's, it's a really uh, good cover. Uh, it's a really uh, good book. Um, what do you think uh, sports, uh, how do you think they play into this idea of friendship and this idea of growing up because you do choose a triathlon and you said you've never done a triathlon <laughs> neither have i although i have played other sports but um you know sports seem to be extremely important uh all around the world uh, also in the united states um mm -hmm. how do you think they can be used in order to uh you know make it a learning experience i am a soccer referee for high school and middle school in my free time i've been doing it for years and years and years okay. and and for TSSAA here in 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 tennessee um and you know i think it is important to make that experience not just an experience of you know winning of competition or losing but also you know just a learning experience in general um why why did you include the the uh, the triathlon as part of this book? Well, I did dream of one time doing a triathlon. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a planner. <laughs> that kind of did this. But it became, that really was probably always in the back of my head is, oh, I'm going to train for a triathlon one day. Because I did walk a half marathon. And then, of course, that wasn't good enough. I was like, okay, <laughs> it's on bigger and better things. And it became such a great backbone for it. But I love the idea that and you see this being a soccer coach, you're teaching teamwork. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, we just started watching Ted Lasso. You know, we'd never ever seen it before, but we'd heard wonderful things about it. And that's what he's doing. This, yeah. uh, those of you that have never watched it, it, it's this, he's trying to teach teamwork and, and, and leaning on each other. And in a way it's what we've been talking about quite a bit today. Mm -hmm. It's a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about, yes, you have to be capable of kicking the ball, you know, you know, too, but at the same time, you've got these other people around you 
to think about and um, to lean on and their strengths, you know, as, as you know, as a coach, you learn who has the strengths, who has mm. some weaknesses, but every one of your players, I'm sure have a strength. Well, I'm, I'm not really a coach. I'm, I'm a soccer referee, but I do, oh, also, sorry, but I, but I do also, you know, my, my, my uncle was a soccer coach for many, many years. So, so I understand uh, what, what you that say, completely. but even yeah. as a referee, I do, I do see refereeing a game as an opportunity for education of the players. Right. It is. And it, it's, it really is teaching life skills. Mm -hmm. So not being one that participated in sports who hated PE <laughs> <laughs> was, was so glad I was in theater. So I didn't have to take PE for two years, um, you know, because I did theater and we had dance or something like that, that I guess took the place of PE. Um, I can see I missed out on something, you know, because although theater had its own teamwork mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. too, um, there are no stars in theater, <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, I think it does. I think sports does. So I wasn't thinking that to be quite honest with you, when I chose that, I really mm -hmm. was thinking, wow, this is a great way to structure the book. Mm -hmm. And a goal to work, to work, to work towards, right? Yes. But when, once I started planning it and thinking about it um, and what's going to happen, it, I got to see, oh, it's teamwork. When, when do things start clicking with them? When they start coaching each other, mm -hmm. when they start being each other's cheerleader, not just training on their own, but going to each of their training sessions and helping each other. And so in a way that teaches them, they can lean on each other. And they all, when that also made the day that they did it even sweeter. I, I agree. And, and we're not going to disclose anything, but that uh, scene uh, or those chapters that deal with the triathlon are uh, really endearing. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed reading that part to, oh, my, okay. to my daughter. And when you read it out loud, it even, uh, it, it's even more interesting because of the rhythm and, you know, just the way you describe that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, to finish, Kimberly, uh, are there any uh, projects that you're working on right now? I seem to have read something about a dog in some interview that you gave recently, yes. but but it, yes. is there anything you can share with us uh, of any of the uh, projects you're working on right now to finish that, our conversation? That is the this I am supposed to be working on right now. <laughs> um, you know, I'm right now being treated for um, cancer, but I'm doing very well. And it, but, and it made my deadline, um, <laughs> go farther out, but I will be working more diligently at that very soon. Cause I'm, um, over a major part, I'll be over a major part of that. I'm, uh, part of my treatment in about a month. And so then I can really focus, you know, on the book and get back to my normal rhythm, you know, of writing every day and working toward my goal, um, which is, is writing about William, William Lincoln Maxwell Jr. <laughs> and it's about a dog. <laughs> well, I can tell you that with, with my daughter Libby being such a big dog lover, uh, she, she's definitely going to be very interested in that book. So you need to finish that. <laughs> I will. Oh, I will. I'm really excited about, about him. And I was so happy that my um, editor, it's going to, you know, be maybe considered a young middle grade, you know, but I hope it has a, a broad a, a appeal to all ages yeah well Kimberly uh it has been a pleasure once again you know talking to you on the written page I want to um wish you all the best for your uh cancer treatment uh okay. you know I want to tell you that you'll be in mine and my family's prayers and thoughts and I'm really hoping that goes uh, as best as it is possible for you Thank you, Anton. I appreciate that. And I appreciate being here today. I enjoy talking to you. You've always are such a great interviewer. So thank you for reading my books and for asking the quite kind of questions that make me think <laughs> harder. <laughs> well, it's it's really easy uh, chatting with you and, and, and I appreciate your time. Uh, also your work, uh, the book we've been talking about is The Hurricane Girls, just came out on Christy Ottaviano books. Uh, and we really, uh, recommend uh, this book. It's really wonderful, as many other books that Kimberly has written. 
The Lost Boys gift is another one. Then when Zachary Beaver came to town, which um, I believe uh, was the recipient of the National Book Award for young, uh, young People's Literature. And then Dear Hank Williams, which is the first book that I read by uh, Kimberly, uh, My Louisiana Sky. There's just so many uh, really good books that Kimberly Willis Holt has written, and all of them are uh, highly uh, recommended. Kimberly, once again, thank you very much for uh, being on the written page uh, this morning, and we'll definitely stay in touch and check on you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You have a good day. This has been a presentation of the written page. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, coming to you from Jackson in the state of Tennessee, and our uh, guest today has been Kimberly Willis Holt, uh, the author of The Hurricane Girls, her latest book, and many others that we definitely do recommend. And you're going to be able to listen to this episode very soon on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any comments, leave them underneath uh, the video. And once again, we recommend any books by Kimberly Willis Holt, but particularly the latest one, The Hurricane Girls, which just came out in this year of 2023. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for any comments and for your interest. And we will see you again very soon on another episode of The Written Page on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. Signing off now. Bye-bye, everybody.